are you going to? Okay. And so, so I want to continue on the density of states, and I want to apply it to a test case and see how well that, that works. This is work done uh, with my student Tobias Nisbacher, who is here. And uh, by the way, Tobias is finishing his PhD very soon, and he's looking for a postdoc. <laughs> <laughs> So we're going to have a look at the easy model again. Why? So, so this is the partition function of the easy model with the nearest neural ferromagnetic interaction and the, the external field term. And I'm going to make the external mag magnetic field H pure imaginary. And <coughs> why is that interesting in, in our present context? Because it makes the, the action uh, complex. So there, there's going to be a weight factor which is complex here, where m is the magnetization. So it, yeah, it's a simple model with a severe sign problem. Sign problem is particularly severe because in, when, when h is pure imaginary, then the whole partition function here uh, may vanish. And, and uh, then you have uh, new types of thermodynamic singularities that we're going to see. So there's a combination of a benchmark for sign problem, interesting critical phenomena, and but also I discovered by literature search that this problem had been barely studied just by a single person uh, by a Monte Carlo method. So <coughs> again, this is the partition function. If you define these variables x and y, then up to some prefactor, the partition function is a polynomial in x and y, so it will have uh, zeros in the complex x plane uh, or in the complex y plane. These, these zeros of the partition function in complex x are called Fisher zeros and in complex y are called Lyon zeros. And then we're, we're going to be interested in the Lyon zeros. And uh, Lee and Young, a uh, long, long time ago, showed that uh, these zeros in, in y uh, are on the unit circle which is an, another way to state that the zeros occur when h is pure imaginary, or zero. And moreover, the, the, the Lyon theorem says that above the Curie temperature in the high, high temperature disordered phase, actually zeros, Lyon zeros, accumulate along some edge singularity. And uh, we're going to see what, what, what that means. M moreover, Fisher, 20 years later, uh, explained that this edge singularity where zeros accumulate can be in interpreted as a second order phase transition and the universality class is that of a scalar field theory with interaction i phi cube. So i phi cube sounds a little bit strange but, but in fact uh, it, it's uh, one of the examples of a PT symmetric uh, theory uh, dear to Carl Bender. So it's, it's not that exotic. The, the, uh, you would think that the action is unbounded, but, but uh, uh, th th this, when you when you take this factor in the exponent, the, the magnitude of the of the weight remains bounded. It's, it is bounded by one. So the, actually, the, the whole theory can be studied. So <coughs> what what do these uh, Lyon zeros uh, give you? So let, let's look at the phase diagram of the easy model. This is what what you should be careful where I stand. This is the usual phase diagram when you consider a real a magnetic field. <coughs> so the, the, this red segment represents a first order phase transition uh, and it ends with a second order critical point at the Curie temperature. This is the well known phase diagram. But now, since we're making H complex, let's look at the imaginary direction for H. And then this is the corresponding phase diagram. So you have this h equals 0 uh, segment, which is there as before. But, but now, if you go at temperatures higher than Tc, then the, this line bifurcates into this pair of complex conjugate dotted lines. And, and these are the so-called h singularities. So what, what that means is that inside this domain between the dotted lines, the partition function uh, has no zeros, and then zeros accumulate along these dotted lines. And I, I want to draw your attention to the similarity with QCD. This is the 
putative phase diagram of QCD in a, so for real chemical potential and temperature with a first order line ending with a critical point similar to that and, <coughs> and, and this is uh, taken from a very interesting paper by Misha Stefanov and uh, this is that represents the singularities of the partition function in the complex mu square plane so, and so I want to draw your attention to the similarity between these red dotted lines and, and these red lines here. Uh, so at low temperature, if we, if we increase the chemical potential, we have a singularity along the real mu direction here. And, and uh, in the mu square plane, that corresponds to a singularity here along posi real positive mu square. And now as we increase the temperature, the singularity moves to smaller mu and we, when we reach the critical point here the singularity bifurcates into the complex plane and, and these lines here are the analogs of these edge singularities there so maybe we can learn something by, by studying more closely this easing model so <coughs> we, I haven't mentioned the number of dimensions yet but in, in one dimension you, you have a, a spin chain and then your, um, your easing model is uh, in the absence of external field is always disordered at any temperature so Tc, the critical temperature is, is zero and uh, the phase diagram uh, is modified to something like this at any non-zero temperature you will have a phase where there are no zeros and then H singularities so it, it's analytically solvable <laughs> So it's a good the benchmark problem to compare Monte Carlo with exact results. In, in two dimensions, you, you know the critical exponents as you approach these lines, and, and it's very interesting work. And, and you can try Monte Carlo, and in, in more than two dimensions, essentially nothing has been done yet. So, ah. So in, let, we're going to stay in one dimension, just a spin chain with an imaginary external field. Uh, so you, you can solve that one dimensional model uh, using a transfer matrix. So a, this is the transfer matrix uh, connecting one spin with its neighbor along the chain. These are the matrix elements. And you can diagonalize this matrix and compute the partition function and then look in the so instead of temperature, I, this is the inverse temperature, and this is the imaginary external field. And red means positive Z, blue means negative. So of course, between red and blue, there, there is a line of zeros here. So you see, uh, what I, th this is for increasing uh, system sizes. You see what I said just before, uh, that there's a, there's a region where the partition function is positive, everything behaves the usual way and the two eigenvalues and the one and the two are both real and then uh, here the, the partition function vanishes and above there are alternating uh, regions and, and uh, lines of zeros which become denser and denser as you make your system bigger so the zeros accumulate in that region and, 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 and this is the edge singularity that I mentioned, and uh, what, what, algebraically, what happens is that when you cross these edge singularities, the the, the eigenvalues <coughs> of your transfer matrix <coughs> become complex. So instead of two real eigenvalues, you have a complex conjugate pair, and that gives rise to uh, the possible vanishing of Z. So <coughs> you you really have some. Uh, behavior just like at the second order phase transition for instance the, uh, you can analytically of course compute the, 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 the locus of this edge singularity as a function of the inverse temperature for an infinite size and then look for the finite size corrections so there's a pseudo critical uh, external field for which on the finite size the partition function will vanish and it's displaced from the thermodynamic limit value by corrections 1 over L squared, etc. You can do all this beautiful analytic finite size scaling. And you can look at the magnetization, the expectation value of the, the, the spin itself, 
And when, when the external field is imaginary, then the magnetization also is imaginary. And as a function of the external field, it diverges when, uh, when you reach this pseudo-critical value. Why? Because the, the denominator in this expectation value is the partition function, and, and the partition function vanishes. So the, the, the ratio diverges. So the, this is what you obtain analytically uh, on systems of increasing size. Uh, the magnetization, imaginary magnetization, as a function of the uh, external imaginary field, and uh, it's on a log scale because it, it increases dramatically and diverges here when you reach the first zero of the partition function, the, the edge singularity. So we, we, we want to, uh, and, and, and then you see the accumulation of zeros as you increase the system size, the wiggles become denser and denser. So we want to look at this quantity, the magnetization, by uh, Monte Carlo. And <coughs> we're going to use the density of state method. And, and I want to call your attention to all the work. Uh, so so the, the first work uh, where this method uh, is applied to QCD that I know of is by Andreas Goch, 30 years almost ago. Uh, and, and he himself uh, cites uh, Amersley and Hanscom, the Bible of Monte Carlo and the last millennium. And at, in those days, this was called stratified sampling because you divide your Hilbert space into layers of constant, in, in this case, constant magnetization. So, so it's a really old method. The LLR improvement is, is very interesting when you have a continuous spectrum. Uh, but, but here, in the easy model, the spectrum is discrete, so we, do, we don't, there's, there's no it's not a place where to apply the LLR method. We can use the ordinary density of state method, whereby we rewrite the partition function here as uh, a sum over sectors, sectors of different magnetization. So we insert this delta here, and uh, each sector is weighted by this phase factor. And what's in the brackets are now called the density of state uh, row of M where M is the magnetization. So, and now I, the, the task is to numerically determine rho of M, and the way it is done is uh, by running uh, independent Monte Carlo simulations, which are restricted to sampling neighboring sectors of M. M is even, of course. If you flip one spin, you change the magnetization by two. So the, the, the relevant ratio to measure is the ratio of densities of state for m and m two minus 2. And all the, these ratios can be measured by Monte Carlo. The, 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 the system is at a high temperature. So an ordinary single spin metropolis is, is perfectly adequate. And you obtain these ratios with a relative accuracy, which is independent of the value of n. And, and that's what uh, LLR collaboration calls exponential error suppression. You, you can, this is the result as a function of M, that this is uh, rho, the density of states on a log scale. So you see again this dramatic dynamic range. Um, and the, when you do this Monte Carlo sampling, the relative accuracy here on, on these very rare states is just as good as in the middle. So that, that, that's, why, that, that's what's called exponential error suppression, and it's an, it expresses the fact that the overlap problem has been solved. The, the, think of the sector here of maximum magnetization. That means all speeds are up. There's only one state here in compared to an exponential number of states there. And, and you, uh, you, you, you can determine this density of states with uniform relative accuracy across, across the whole interval. Moreover, you know that there's only one state here, so the normalization of your partition function is fixed, and you can compare the, the, this sum here to um, exact results for the easing model. Works well. Now, as, as Biagio said, uh, what, you're not done. This is the easy part. Once you have rho of m, then you need to fully transform to obtain the partition function in the presence of this external imaginary field. And that's where the sign problem strikes you. So the, the, our observable of choice is going to be the magnetization as a function of the imaginary external field. And uh, I showed you these results before. The, it, uh, it starts at 0, and then it, <coughs> the, the exact result is the, the sign. And it diverges when you reach the edge singularity. 
and, and this is an example of a Monte Carlo. So you see that even though, even though the, the system is small, uh, the, the, the task is difficult. So I want to look at these two questions. What is the computer effort required to go f to, to determine this magnetization for larger h i? And uh, how does the computer effort grow as I increase my system size? So the, the, let, let's first uh, try to go on a fixed system. I fix the temperature, I fix the system size, and I increase the stati statistics by six orders of magnitude between here and there. And, and this is the result that I obtain uh, for my magnetization. So you, you, you see that the crucial point here is uh, as I increase my statistics by a factor of 100, the, the maximum value of H that I can grow increases by a constant, which is about 0.5 in this case. So 0.25 is my maximum here, goes to 0 0.3, 0 0.35, 0 0.4. So clearly, the, yeah, there's an exponential complexity. The computer effort grows exponentially uh, as a function of the external field that I want to grow. So Philip, so here you're, you're sampling from this determined role. Yes. Yeah, so you're not doing any measurement? You're using my time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's okay. okay. I'll talk very slowly. Yeah. <laughs> so you're not uh, doing some kind of semi-analytical integration of the phase. You're really sampling. That's this coming. Yeah. But, but uh, yeah, this plain vanilla version has an exponential complexity in the external field. But, but the, most in, the, the most crucial for QCD is to go to the thermodynamic limit. So how does the effort grow with the volume? So now, uh, here I, I, I fix the, the relative error. It's always the same. And I increase my system size. And you see how the, uh, the quality of the observable degra degrades. It, it, each time I multiply my system size by 2, I have to, to be less ambitious and reduce my uh, imaginary field by the same amount. So th this is the evidence, again, of an exponential complexity, this time as a function of the volume. That, that's bad. That's what we wanted to fight against. And uh, the density of space suffers just like any other method from an exponential complexity. So what can we do? Then let's try to improve the situation. The, the, the first idea that we had it was to change to dual variables. Uh, since we've been working with worms for a long time, then let's do that here. You can rewrite your partition function in these new variables, which are k attached to, to links, 0 or 1 variable, and m monomers attached to side 0 or 1 with a constraint here. And then you, now you have the same partition function expressed in a sum of sectors, but this, these are sectors of fixed monomer numbers. And uh, yeah, you, you can you still have this equivalent of a Fourier transform, but the variables are different. What, what happens? So th this is the density of states that I showed you before as a function of magnetization. <coughs> this is, for the same system, the density of states as a function of monomer numbers. And, and uh, it looks very different. And, but the, the results, in the end, for same statistics, same accuracy, same computer efforts, they are yeah, almost the same. Maybe you can go to slightly larger very slightly larger values of the imaginary field in this case with monomers. But it's not, it's not a solution to what we want. So what, what LLR has been suggesting, and we're going to have a talk hopefully this afternoon on this, is to, and, and that's what Hert was asking about, uh, instead of using the Monte Carlo uh, data, the raw Monte Carlo data, let's smooth the Monte Car this Monte Carlo data with a clever ansatz which reduces the number of degrees of freedom, but doesn't spoil the physics. And then you have to be very clever to find this answer. So I wasn't. I looked at this curve and said, well, it looks like a poly polynomial of even degree. And I fitted. So here on this figure, there are actually two curves, the exact one and the fit. And you don't see the difference. But, but when you compute from the fit the magnetization, you get this red line, whereas the exact answer is this purple line. So you get spurious poles, you get the wrong answer. Okay, so so you, this is not a good fit. So maybe we were, if this is the wrong function to fit. Instead of f fitting the density of state, let's, let's look, fit this ratio, uh, fit this ratio, rho of m, of rho of m minus 2. And this is, again, this plot where the, there's the exact 
uh, number and the fit, and there's, uh, yeah, the, to the naked eye, there's no difference, but again, when you compute the magnetization, you, you get the wrong answer. So introducing a fit uh, introduces a bias. You, you can change the, the fitting procedure, try to fit better the, the tail here, that's what I thought would work, and indeed it works a little better than, than there. But anyway, it's, yeah, you, you, you lose something, you, you don't converge to the correct answer anymore. So my conclusions, with the zero time I have, is uh, that this easing model with Emmanuel Rich is, is fabulously interesting uh, and hasn't really been looked at from a numerical angle before. Uh, the, the density of state method is uh, from the last century to the last millennium. It's an old stuff. And, and uh, here, there, in this paper, PRL, there are results for a 2 to the 4th lattice. It was not followed up by studies on larger lattice because of the, ex of the complexity, which is exponential in the volume. And uh, the, the LLR method provides the <coughs> so-called exponential error suppression, but this is not what we want. We want to reduce the exponential complexity in terms of the volume, and, and uh, we want to bypass or overcome this hurdle, and the LLR method, as far as I can tell, uh, doesn't do it. Uh, you can try to fit, but I haven't been clever enough uh, to, to find the right kind of fit without introducing a bias. And, and uh, as a final remark, yeah, Viaggio also mentioned this is a Fourier transform going from the density of state to the magnetization. This is, of course, very similar to QCB, where the canonical and grand canonical partition functions are related by Fourier transform in the imaginary chemical potential. Thank you very much. We have time for maybe one question. Well, it's maybe more as a comment. So um, it's clear that uh, the SPR was explaining that uh, the sign problem, uh, the solution to the sign problem might be theory dependent. And uh, we, we also felt uneasy uh, with the fit of log row to a polynomial, which solved the problem just for two theories, which is set three and, and heavy dense QCD. And then we, we introduced maybe a uh, fit independent approach, which is this modified cumulative expansion. So maybe that would be a way forward to Yes. So, so I, I was not aware of this cumulative expansion, so I didn't test it. But, but the, the first step in the cumulative expansion is, is to, to fold the theory. So here we, we have. Uh, here, the phase factor when H is imaginary, the phase factor is, is, goes from minus volume to plus volume. And, and the first step of this cumulant expansion approach is to fold this on the interval minus pi pi. And, and uh, as you do that, uh, you, you see that uh, if you start with a broad, very broad Gaussian and you fold it to the interval minus pi pi, it's going to become extremely flat. So a priori, it makes your uh, the, the, your task much harder, uh, and, and uh, yeah, uh, intuitive. So I, I, I don't have uh, I don't have concrete uh, results to show testing this approach. But a priori, it seems like a counterintuitive uh, way to, to to improve the situation because you 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 fold. It. Maybe a very quick question here. Very quick. Uh, uh, <laughs> for the this uh, polynomial or cumulata prospect, uh, <coughs> can you observe uh, convergence in using more and more cumulas, using more and more? I haven't tried the cumulative expansion. Well, the, the other one, the polynomial. Would you, uh, would you test for convergence? Because it should say that uh, actually it does not work at all. So, so here I, I fitted with a six degree polynomial. Uh, for a system of size 64, where there are, um, I think, 17 independent numbers that, that enter here. M, M is e, the, the row of M is an even function, and M itself takes even values from, from 0 to 64. So, so uh, yeah, you know, maybe there are 30 screen numbers. Isn't the exact but answer a 30 of order 32? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so uh, Six 
is too small. Yes. 32 is the whole amount of information. I didn't try anything in between, but clearly there's, it's a trade-off between statistical and systematic error, and you can get anything you want. I think but if you don't have exact answer, answer, you see no, no convergence. This is would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But you, you see yeah, improvement, but, but with increased statistical amounts. To stay within the schedule, maybe we can postpone the classes for later. Thank you again. And the next and last speaker this morning is Alfred Vaidinius. You put it in? Yes, it does.